This is quite possibly the best Sega Nomad mod kit out there. It gives you crystal clear RGB video onto a high quality IPS panel, the ability to overclock the CPU, an internal rechargeable lithium polymer battery, and so many other features to bring this mid 90s behemoth of a handheld into the year 2022. Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Tito and welcome to another episode of Retro Renew. Today, I am so excited to share with you what I think is the absolute best mod kit out there for the Sega Nomad. This is the Venus Sub 2020 VA0 board, or as I like to call it, the last Sega mod you'll ever need. Now, this mod kit packs a ton of features. On top of the beautiful LCD panel, which taps into the console's RGB signal, this kit also gives you an internal 3200 milliamp hour lithium polymer battery, good for up to four hours of gameplay, USB-C charging, and so much more. I'll get into all that a little bit later though. This kit was designed and built by Oleg Endo, who lives in Japan. He engineered this mod from the ground up, and his attention to detail is really quite remarkable. Definitely follow him on Twitter to keep up to date with his really fascinating work. All right, so in this video, I'm gonna give you a quick overview of all the parts included in this kit. Then I'll show you how to do the full installation, review all the features this kit has to offer, go over the pros and cons, and of course provide you with my overall thoughts. Also, Bob of RetroRGB was kind enough to provide us with his analytical expertise by taking a look at how this mod affects the video output, both RGB and composite by comparing the Nomad before and after I did the mod. So be sure to stay tuned for his in-depth analysis later in the video. Okay, so now let's take a look at all the components included in this kit. First, we have this baggie, which contains the ribbon cable adapter, the dual oscillator board to enable compatibility with the PAL video standard, and a couple capacitors for an optional audio mod. Next, we have this baggie containing two thermal pads, which will definitely come in handy for the overclocking mod we'll also be tackling, as well as dissipate some of the heat generated by the battery. Contained in this bag is the ribbon cable to connect the subboard to the main board, as well as some magnet wire to make various connections and a pre-made audio cable to tap stereo audio. Oleg also kindly includes a glass screen lens to replace the stock one, which no doubt has scratches like mine does. I'm glad he included this. And lastly is the Venus subboard, which is really at the heart of it all. It has the LCD already pre-mounted as well as the 3200 milliamp hour battery. Like I said, the attention to detail is incredible. From the power switch mechanism, which was specifically designed for this kit, to the custom LED light pipe for the USB-C port. You can really tell that Oleg spent some serious time meticulously designing this mod. Okay, so those are all the parts that came with this kit. Now, let me show you how to put it all together. All right, to get started, we first need to crack this Nomad open. The console is held together with four Phillips screws around the perimeter and a single four and a half millimeter game bit on the bottom. Once we're inside the Nomad, we need to remove these two Phillips screws securing the cartridge slot cover flap. Then proceed to remove the six smaller screws securing the metal RF shielding. Now go ahead and lift the metal shield off and then unfasten these two longer screws underneath. With the help of a spudger, pry the board out paying attention to the controller port area which requires a bit of maneuvering to get it out. Next, delatch the bales securing the ribbon cable and then pull it out. Now we need to remove the securing bale by gently prying it off as shown. This will allow us to install the adapter board later on. Next, we're gonna install the dual oscillator board by first removing capacitor C18. Also remove the ferrite bead labeled FB3 as shown. Then clean the area up with some solder braid. And this is what it should look like. Now grab the oscillator board. Tin the pads labeled TP5, TP54, and TP4. Then align the oscillator board to those pads and solder it in place. Now 
and this is what it should look like. Now we're going to solder a wire from this pad on the oscillator board to this pad shown here. It is one pad over from TP19. And this is the oscillator board fully installed. Next, we're going to do the optional audio mod by first removing capacitor C12, and then installing this extremely tiny 100 picofarad capacitor. This is the absolute smallest capacitor I have ever installed. Definitely be careful as this thing is probably pretty easy to lose. This is what it should look like fully installed. The next capacitor we need to install requires us to remove the solder mask on this trace from resistor R5. When it's ready, tin the trace with some solder. Then install the included 47 microfarad capacitor between the exposed trace and this pad shown here. And this is what it should look like. Next we're going to enable master system compatibility by first soldering a wire to this pin on the cartridge slot. Take the included magnet wire and route it through this via near TP107. After making the connection to this pin, secure the wire. I'm just going to be using a dab of hot glue. And I put a piece of Kapton tape down for good measure. Then on the other side of the PCB, you need to solder to pin 45 of the IC3 integrated circuit. I did this off camera to make sure I made a good connection. Next, we're going to enable the system language select feature by cutting the trace between the two pads on the JP1 jumper. This is what it should look like, and you can confirm that the trace is cut by checking for continuity with a multimeter. Next, solder a wire about 2 centimeters in length to this pad. Now we're going to enable the ability to select NTSC and PAL video modes by cutting the trace between the JP3 jumper. All you need to do is simply cut the trace. We don't need to solder any wires here. Next, we're going to install the audio cable included with the kit. This enables cartridge audio support. Solder the white left audio wire to this pin, and the red right audio wire to this pin. The ground wire is attached here. And this is what it should all look like. Next, you'll need to feed the wire through this opening on the PCB closest to the TP51 test pad. Once you pull it through, this is what it should look like. Now, this next part is tricky. If you want to enable the soft reset feature, you need to cut the pin 78 trace on the ASIC. You need to be very careful since this trace is very close to other adjacent traces on the board. Remember, this is an optional mod and it's not necessary to install Oleg's subboard LCD kit. After cutting the trace, you need to solder a 2 cm length of wire to pin 78. I put a piece of Kapton tape directly under the wire to ensure it is completely isolated. Now in order to enable the overclocking feature, we need to cut another trace, this time to the via right above the C1 capacitor. You also need to remove the solder mask covering the trace. Then solder a wire to the via, and another to the exposed trace as shown here. Great! Now grab the ribbon cable adapter board, and then insert it into the connector on the PCB. In order to anchor and fully secure the adapter, we need to solder the included small metal hooks. Place the hook into the ribbon cable adapter board as shown, and then solder it in place with the other end connected to the capacitor below. This is simply to anchor the board. I don't think these are entirely necessary since there is enough friction holding the board into the connector, but this will definitely ensure that the adapter board will never come out. Then do the same on the other side. Now we start making all the wire connections, first with the language select wire shown here, followed by the wire for the soft reset. Next tin the pads for the audio wires, the white wire for the left audio channel goes to the left pad, ground goes to the middle pad, and the right audio channel goes to the right pad. Lastly, solder the two overclock wires to these pads shown here. And this is how everything should look when you're done. 
Now we can install the ribbon cable into the adapter board. Next, grab the shell and remove the RF shielding so we can install the thermal pads. Grab the thinner pad and place it in this general location shown here. And be sure to peel off the plastic film, otherwise it won't transfer any heat. Then reinstall the metal shielding. Now place the much thicker pad over the main ASIC chip. Again, don't forget to peel off the thin plastic film. Next, drop in the main board into the rear shell housing and then secure it in place by installing the two screws. Then install the metal housing. And then put the cartridge door back on. Okay, now we need to remove the old board which has the original LCD. Remove the screws securing it to the shell. Then unplug the speaker. The board should now come out, but be sure the gasket around the LCD remains on the shell because we'll be reusing it. And since we want to replace the screen lens, go ahead and pop out the original plastic one like so. Clean any residue left behind by the old lens. Next, gently remove the battery which is just held in place with some adhesive. And this is what the board looks like underneath. It's simply stunning. Oleg did a really amazing job designing this kit. Go ahead and peel off the protective film on the IPS panel. And then drop the new subboard into the front shell housing. And be sure not to forget to install the power switch cover. Now go ahead and secure the subboard to the front shell. Pay attention to the screw here on the switch mechanism. This came pre-installed and will replace the screw that was originally here prior, so you'll be left with an extra screw. Then plug the speaker into this connector labeled mono. We'll talk about why there are two connectors here later in the video. Next go ahead and plug in the ribbon cable to the subboard. And then reinstall the battery and plug it in. Go ahead and close the console up, making sure to tuck the ribbon cable into this small cavity. Then button it up. And lastly, install the fresh glass screen lens, of course making sure there is no dust on the IPS panel. Then peel off the plastic film, insert a game, and there you have it a fully modified Sega Nomad. After doing this mod, I have to say that the results are absolutely stunning. The screen is razor sharp, and the added convenience of an internal battery, as well as USB-C charging, on top of all the other internal modifications, makes this truly the end-all, be-all kit for modding the Sega Nomad. Now, before I do a deep dive of all the features this kit brings to the table, I want to turn it over to Bob of Retro RGB to give us some insight on how this kit affects a Nomad, showcasing some of the comparisons of before and after I did the modification. Hey everybody, Bob from Retro RGB here, and Tito was nice enough to send me the Nomad both before and after the mod for me to take a look at, and I was able to do before and after comparisons. And first of all, Oleg's mod is perfectly safe to use with all video output options at the same time as the internal built-in screen. So the video voltage is correct, the sync voltage is correct, and it's totally safe to use any combination of external screen with internal screen mod at the same time. Also, the video quality was excellent, but this was a model of Nomad that didn't seem to have much interference on the video output side of things, even when it was completely stock, which I'm not really sure why. I think there's some models of Nomads are just inherently more noisy than others, but this was already pretty clean, except after the mod, it cleaned up even better, which is always a good thing. Same thing even with the composite video side of things, which is always noisy on any Genesis console. So it was really great to see equal or better than performance on the video side with this, as well as good for safety too. Well, thanks very much to Tito for having me on, and back to him for the rest of the video. 
Awesome. Thank you, Bob, so much for doing that in-depth analysis on the effect this mod has on the video output quality of the Sega Nomad after installing Oleg's kit. If you want to learn more about the technical aspects of mods like this one and see interviews with some of the interesting folks in the retro gaming community, RetroRGB's website and YouTube channel are an incredible source of information. Bob does similar in-depth analysis of a lot of retro gaming mods and products, so definitely give both his YouTube channel and website a look. I'll leave links to them in the video description below. Now, in addition to the video enhancements, Oleg has made some changes to the audio as well. Compared to the stock Nomad, the audio performance is slightly altered, as confirmed by the MD Fourier analysis. The sound is overall a bit brighter, and Oleg is working with the MD Fourier team on further possible improvements for the next hardware revision. All right, now let's go over all the features of this kit. Starting from the top, let's take a look at the new soft slide power switch. I want to say first that this is a neat engineering design with a very cool mechanism that articulates the power switch. To power on the Nomad, you simply perform a short slide. To power it off, you need to hold the power switch for a couple seconds. Now something that the Nomad could never do is perform a soft reset. But now, by doing a short slide while the console is on, you can now perform a soft reset which is pretty useful. Really neat stuff. Now right next to the power switch is again another wonderfully designed component and that is the USB-C port, which again is dual purpose. First, whenever Oleg introduces a future software update, you will simply connect the Nomad to the computer via this USB-C port to perform the update. I think it's awesome that Oleg integrated the ability to update the firmware, which in my mind will keep the kit relevant well into the future as opposed to being a one and done product. I'm really excited to see what capability and improvements he'll add in the future. Now the other purpose of the USB-C port is to charge the internal 3200 milliamp hour battery. But of course, it does it in style. The beautifully designed LED indicator light lets you know when it's charging by displaying an amber color, and when it's fully charged by displaying a green color. You can really tell that Oleg spent some time designing this component. I mean, look at the LED light pipe. Simply beautiful. Moving down the console, here we have the front low battery LED, which also serves multiple functions. First, it will illuminate red when there's about 10 to 15 minutes of battery life left. Additionally, it will turn orange when you connect an external battery to the console. It basically lets you know that the external battery is charging the internal one, which is really awesome. I have my Laser Bear battery pack connected and it works flawlessly. I think it's really cool that you have two ways of charging the console through the USB-C port, and through the rear battery terminals. On the bottom of the console, where the volume dial used to be, we now have a rocker switch. Moving it from side to side adjusts the volume of the console, displaying the level on the screen. If you push the rocker switch in, it will mute the Nomad, which is absolutely awesome. Now on the other side, where the brightness adjustment dial used to be, is another rocker switch. Moving this one left and right will adjust the brightness of the screen accordingly. However, perhaps the most interesting part of the mod will reveal itself when you push in the rocker switch, and that is the built-in OSD, or on-screen display. Here you can access all the various mods we did to the console. Now, if you didn't do all the optional mods, this menu will auto-detect which ones were not performed and gray out those options, which is really incredible. It's pretty cool that the software is smart enough to detect which mods were installed and which weren't. But since I did all the mods, let's go over them. First, we have video mode. This will be enabled if you installed the dual oscillator board. Essentially, you can toggle between NTSC, which is the only supported clock oscillator on the stock Nomad, and PAL regions. PAL 60, from what I understand, is essentially an NTSC clock signal, but with PAL colors. Next, we have the video filter, which allows you to adjust the sharpness of the image. There is sharp, which is my preferred setting, medium, and soft. To me, Soft is sort of mimicking composite video, which sort of looks like my original composite LCD modded Nomad I did a little while ago. Next, we have the language select feature. Toggling between Western and Japanese will allow some really cool functionality. Some games, such as the original Streets of Rage, will have subtle differences depending on the region you select. With Japanese, it will display the Japanese title screen. And with Western selected, it will show the North American title screen. Now next is possibly one of the coolest features, 
you can overclock the Motorola 86000 processor to 10 MHz from its stock 7 MHz. That is roughly a 43% increase in performance. Now what to do with all that extra headroom is beyond me, but it's still pretty cool. I'm sure the added thermal pads will help dissipate the additional heat generated by overclocking the CPU. If you know of any games that will best showcase this additional computing power, let me know down below in the comments. The next option is pretty self-explanatory. Here you can select either the original 3-button layout or utilize the 6-button layout for games that support it. After that is the video out toggle. In order to output video through the AV port, you need to select it here, unlike an unmodified Nomad, which is outputting video all the time. This was done to save power since having video out enabled consumes more energy. Next is the sync setting. Here you can toggle sync on green, on or off. The next option is speaker out. Since I only have one speaker installed, mono is what I have selected. But if you remember, Oleg actually included another speaker connector on the PCB. So in the future, you can actually install another speaker for true stereo audio, which is really neat. The boot quips option is a really nice touch. Toggling this option on displays a different Sega quote upon boot. Some of them are pretty funny and it's just an overall really nice touch and I absolutely love that this was included. And the last option is software update. Like I stated previously, Oleg has built in the ability to update the system software to further tweak and refine the overall experience. I think this is really incredible and again I'm glad that this was included. Now another mod I performed allows for the ability to play Sega Master System games. This isn't something that is unique to this kit, but since it was part of the installation manual, I enabled this feature so it is now possible to play those games on this system. Additionally, Sega CD games are also supposed to be supported. However, I could not get it to work on my particular Nomad. Bob lent me his Mega EverDrive Pro to test out Oleg's kit, and unfortunately I couldn't get the Sega CD games to boot from it. I am currently working with Oleg to figure out what could be going on here. Now, if I can get this to support Sega CD games, that would be really awesome. Okay, so that's all the really amazing features of this kit. But now, let's get into the pros and cons. There is really a lot, and I mean a lot to like about Oleg's kit. I have to say that this is the most comprehensive kit out there for the Sega Nomad. The first pro I want to start off with is the screen. It's absolutely gorgeous. Gaming on the Nomad has never been better. The screen pulls the RGB signal from the Nomad, giving you a pretty sharp picture. Compared to my composite modded Nomad, the difference is night and day. It is way sharper. Now Bob also very kindly lent me his Nomad which has been modded with the RGB driver kit from Japan. This kit also taps the RGB signal to give an equally crisp image. Comparing the RGB driver to Oleg's kit, I think both provide fantastic image quality. I will say however that the RGB driver has a bit more color saturation than Oleg's kit, which looks a little bit duller. But overall, both provide fantastic results. The next pro is the internal battery. This is such a huge improvement since using an external battery adds bulk to an already very bulky handheld. And with up to four hours of gameplay, I think that is more than enough time. Another pro is the overall quality of the mod. It's exceptional. The attention to detail with things like the power switch mechanism and the LED light pipe really just showcases all the work that Oleg put into designing this kit. Also, if you don't do all the extra mods like I did, such as the language select, overclock, and video modes, this essentially becomes a high quality drop-in LCD upgrade, which really doesn't require any soldering at all. Anyway, I could go on talking about all the things I love about this kit, but let's get into some of the cons. The first one is the difficulty of the mod. It presents a barrier for those who would like to perform this mod themselves. That is, of course, if you want to utilize its full potential. For those that just want the benefits of an improved screen, like I said previously, all you really need to do is remove the mainboard connector locking bail, install the cable adapter board, and replace the front subboard. In all honesty, if you just want that crispy RGB screen, this kit is essentially drop-in, which is pretty incredible. I think for those who just want an improved screen, it would be great if Oleg sold a variation of this kit which doesn't come with all the extra components for the additional mods. Now another con is that you have to cut some traces 
which while technically it is reversible, you are permanently altering the PCB. Unfortunately, there really isn't a way around this except to not do some of the mods. And the last con is that this mod is expensive. I paid 22,500 yen, which is about 200 US dollars. So this is certainly a pricey mod, but I think you are definitely getting that value out of this kit and some. I have to say that even though there are a few cons, this is an incredible way to upgrade and bring new life to the Sega Nomad. I want to thank Oleg for making such an amazing and comprehensive mod for the handheld. I definitely think this is the absolute best kit out there for the console. I also want to thank Bob of RetroRGB for coming onto the program and offering his in-depth analysis of the more technical aspects of the mod. I'll leave links to both Oleg and Bob's social media down below in the comments. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all next Thursday.